Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we'll be discussing the germ cell tumors. We have already discussed the surface epithelial tumors in my previous video, so please do check that out before watching this germ cell tumors video. So before I start with my germ cell tumors lecture, I would like to touch up on a fact which I missed in my previous video. That is Pseudomyxoma peritoneae can also occur from causes other than that of ovarian tumors. The other causes, the most high yield of them is tumor of appendix. So if you have Pseudomyxoma peritoneae and it is involving both of the ovaries, remember both of the ovaries, you have to rule out tumor of appendix first because appendix is known to cause pseudomyxoma peritoneae and how do we know that it is the tumor of the appendix that is causing that? Uh, it will most likely involve both of the ovaries. So hope you understand that. It is a very high yield point. So moving on. Uh, germ cell tumors. I have classified germ cell tumors and this is a subclassification. It has uh, uh, teratomas, embryonal carcinoma, yolk sac tumors, dysgerminoma, and choriocarcinoma. I find myself often forgetting this subclassification. So this is why I try to make as much memory hooks as I can in every step if possible. So I have made this mnemonic to learn this subclassification and that is teach every young daughter cooking. I know it is kind of misogynist but please excuse that and use this as a memory hook. So TEACH stands for teratoma, T stands for teratoma, E for embryonal carcinoma, Y for yolk sac, D for dysterminoma, and C for choriocarcinoma. So you know, the lamer the mnemonic is, the better it sticks into your mind. This is the Newton's fourth law. So the germ cell tumors, uh, these are the general characteristics. It is present mainly in women of reproductive age. This is the biggest high yield point you can take away from this because if the woman is very old, we'll, we will be most likely associating that with surface epithelial tumors. But in germ cell tumors, the woman, she's very young. She's, the age range is about 15 to 30. So she's in her reproductive age. So whenever you get a clinical vignette and the woman, and she has an ovarian cancer, of course, and the woman is in reproductive age, she's very young. She's like 25 or 30, or there are some subclassification tumors, subclassified tumors that even occur in in children less than three years old. So you will consider germ cell tumors. So starting off, starting on with teratoma, teratoma is very high yield. The one thing that you should know about teratoma is that it, it is composed of fetal tissues. Remember my sketch that I drew in my last video? Uh, I drew a picture of a follicle and I told you that the different components of the follicle are responsible for the various tumors. So the oocyte, it gives rise to these germ cell tumors. So it is definitely well known that they have some fetal component in it. So a teratoma has a fetal component. It is composed of fetal tissues. And the other very high yield fact about this is that it consists of two or more germ cell layers. So what are the germ cell layers you ask? They are the ectoderm, the endoderm, and the mesoderm. So it can have ectoderm or mesoderm, ectoderm or endoderm or anything else. So moving on, teratoma is also further classified into mature and immature. So mature is mostly benign. Okay, it is very uh, easy to learn this because mature people are, don't cause that much of a ruckus as compared to children or other people that are very immature. So it is very, I think it's very self-explanatory. So how do we know if a teratoma is mature or immature? So we see it, we examine it. And if we find an immature component in it, like neuroepithelium, 
please learn this right now and right here neuroepithelium if neuroepithelium is mentioned in it it is immature teratoma or there is another possibility and that is that obviously we know that teratoma uh, is composed of various components various uh, germ cell layer derivatives so if any component of it further develops any malignancy then that makes that teratoma immature teratoma so for example it is composed of skin there are nails in it there are a cartilage hair so if the most characteristic the most high yield fact that i'm going to tell you in this is that the most important of this and most common is that you may develop a squamous cell carcinoma of skin if skin is the component of that teratoma so if that happens like that component develops a further malignancy then it's also a mature immature teratoma so so moving on towards the embryonal tumor they are very rare actually but i have not missed them out because it is essential to know about the rare tumors as well so one characteristic feature of this tumor is that it is very aggressive and it is very malignant because it has a lot of undifferentiated cells and they tend to go everywhere they spread everywhere so it is malignant and the mean age group in which this tumor presents itself is 15 so girls who are in the age group of like 10 to i don't know 17 they can develop this tumor so this this tumor releases hormones so it can present in a patient as for example there's a girl that comes to the clinic and she is going through her puberty at the age of 10 so we will rule this tumor out as it is the cause of sexual precocity or there is an abnormal uterine bleeding outside the menstrual cycle Moving on towards that, this, this is all you need to know about the embryonal tumor, by the way. Moving on towards that dysterminoma, it is a very important and high yield topic. So please pay attention to this slide. It is the most common malignant germ cell tumor. It is equivalent to male seminoma. Male seminoma, it is a male genital tract tumor. And we will be discussing male genital tract tumors in my upcoming videos. So stay tuned for that and on histology you will find fried egg cell appearance and what do we mean by fried egg cell appearance? It means that it will have a lot of clear cytoplasm and there will be a prominent nucleus. So it kind of gives an illusion of a fried egg. This is why we call it fried egg cell appearance. The serum HCG and LDH will be raised. It is a very high yield point because the ovarian tumors are mainly recognized by their specific appearance or their tumor markers or any serum markers there is. So the HCG and LDH will be raised in this terminoma and it will be most likely mentioned in the clinical vignette which will be indicating, indicating that it is a this terminoma. It is sometimes associated with hypercalcemia. It is not yet understood why uh, it is that but it is not really important. So you can forget about that. Uh, when you see the slide, the histological examination, on histological examination, you'll see a lot of lymphocytic infiltration, which I will be showing in one of my next slides. So to me, there is a lot of information about this germinoma and it being a very high yield topic, I cannot retain all of this. So I have created a hack sheet or a mnemonic to understand all of the important points about this tumor and to make it also fun. So it is weird. Let me warn you about that. So here it is. Diseased hands lay dozens of eggs. I know it makes no sense, but listen to me first. Whenever this is a memory hook that I have created for myself. So whenever I hear about this germinoma, I imagine a diseased hen. Sorry for the visual, but it is actually very helpful. 
I imagine a diseased hen and it is laying dozens of eggs. So the D from the disease, it stands for the dysterminoma. The H stands for the HCG, which is elevated in this tumor. The L stands for the LDH, which is also elevated in this tumor. And the D again stands for dysterminoma and X stands for its fried egg cell looking appearance. So hopefully it makes sense to you too. I'm really sorry if it doesn't and if you find it stupid, but to me, it, it works for me. Moving on towards another high yield tumor, which is the endodermal sinus or the yolk sac tumor. It really stands out. This tumor is different than all of the other tumors because it is present in children and in children, particularly male infants. So it is really different because all the other tumors they are mainly present in women or girls, but this is present in male infants. So the serum alpha fetoprotein will be raised in it and it is easy to understand because uh, it is common in kids and fetal or fetal means kids. So alpha fetoprotein is raised. I have highlighted it with a pink color. So whenever I think that there is a memory hook or an easy way to understand it or learn it, I highlight it with a pink color and I highlight all the other high yield information with a yellow color. The most characteristic thing about endodermal sinus is that it has schiller devolved bodies. What are schiller devolved bodies? They are glomeruloid structures. It means that they resemble glomerulus. How do they resemble glomerulus? I'll show you in a bit when I show a slide of, show you a slide of the histological presentation of this tumor. It has a yellow mass, okay? As my job is to make things easier for you so that you can understand all of the important information related to endodermal sinus tumor, I have come up with a mnemonic for this too. And let me warn you again, this is also a very weird mnemonic. So here it goes. Scientist dude likes to cobble fried egg yolk. So I've used the word scientist dude because this tumor mostly involves male infants whereas in this germinoma it involved uh, women so that is why the word diseased hands but this involves male children so this is why scientist dude. So the SD from scientist dude stands for shillard wall bodies. The G from the gobble stands, from, stands for glomeruloid. It means that it resembles glomerulus. The F from fried stands for alpha fetoprotein, which is raised in this tumor. And the Y from the yolk denotes that the other name for this tumor is yolk sac tumor. So scientist dudes likes to gobble fried egg yolk. So hopefully it makes sense to you and it is helpful to you because it is definitely very helpful for me and I just imagine a scientist dude whenever I hear about endodermal sinus tumor. So this just creates a memory hook for me. Hopefully it gives you a rough idea on how to memorize all of this information. You can make your own mnemonics if you want to and I would suggest that but these work for me and if you want to use these then no problem. All the best. Moving on towards the choriocarcinoma, to learn the information about choriocarcinoma, you have to remember that it is a bunch of C's and we'll discuss that further and I've highlighted C with a pink ink because it is a memory hook. So it is a rare tumor and it is malignant and it spreads via the blood and there are only a few tumors that are carcinomas that spread via the blood because carcinomas are known to spread by the lymphatic drainage so it spreads by via the blood so the way i remember it is the bunch of c's so c stands for courier it means that it goes everywhere it it spreads everywhere so c for courier and it is malignant it spreads everywhere so that makes sense. It has a cannonball metastasis in lungs. So it goes towards the lungs and it forms metast there, metastasis there. And it is in the form of a cannonball, which again, I use a bunch of C's mnemonic to learn. C for cannonball and choriocarcinoma. That makes sense too. It is fast growing. We know that 
and it develops from trophoblast. So we know that the fetal tissues and all of this is formed uh, by syncytial trophoblast uh, and cytotrophoblast. So it is formed from trophoblast. But the main characteristic thing about this is that there are no chronic villi present in it. The chronic villi are absent, but syncytial trophoblast and cytotrophoblast, they are present. There is an increase in beta HCG because it, it really makes sense because beta HCG is normally secreted by syncytial trophoblast. So if syncytial trophoblast plus cytotrophoblast form a tumor, they are more like most likely to produce beta HCG too. So it also causes the formation of uh, increases the risk for the formation of theca lutein cyst which is actually the hyperplasia of the theca interna due to the effect of hcg hcg normally acts on the theca interna so that it can grow and to produce to form the fetal tissues and everything else the structures and everything else so if there is the constant there, it is being constantly hit on by the beta HCG, it will grow and it will form a cyst. An other important fact about it is that the patient suffering from choriocarcinoma may present in the clinic with hemoptysis. And we may think that it is due to a lung cancer or some other uh, another disease like tuberculosis, but it is actually due to the mets formed in the lungs due to the choriocarcinoma, due to the cannonball metastasis in the lungs. The prognosis of choriocarcinoma is particularly high yield because it depends on the etiology or the cause of that carcinoma. You have to remember this. It is very important. So if that choriocarcinoma is formed as a complication of any pregnancy, a uh, complication of pregnancy, then it has a good prognosis. It means that it can respond to chemotherapy and shrink in size considerably. But if it is formed due to any other cause then it is bad the prognosis is bad and bad means that you can there they can be spontaneous abortion there can be any ectopic pregnancy or any other fun, further complications in the pregnancy so it it occurs in also pregnant women So here is a gross specimen of a tumor and we can see here in it, I think there is some cartilage in it too. In short, there are a lot of bunch of different things derived from different germ layers. So as we have already studied about this, this is the teratoma. We don't know if it is mature or immature teratoma, but this is a teratoma for sure. Moving on towards the next slide, you can see really a, you know some typical presentation in it. There, there is a prominent nuclear line, a marked nuclear ATPI. You can see some necrosis in there too. There is nuclear overlap. If you look closely, the nuclei are overlapping with each other. So this is a picture of a typical embryonal carcinoma. Embryonal carcinoma is not that important, but you should know it if it ever comes on your examination. So moving on towards the next slide, you can see that there is a fibrous septa and there's a lot of lymphocytic infiltration and round to polygonal cells and there, the, nuclei, the nuclei are typical hyperchromatic nuclei. And it is, it is not clear here, but it is usually divided into lobes like structure. And it is characterized by uniform cells, which is separated by fibrous septa with lymphocytes. And this is an example. This is a picture of a disc germinoma. So you should know what a disc germinoma looks like. So moving on, I think you, you will know about this because it has a glomerulite-like structure. So it is an endodermal sinus tumor, a yolk sac tumor or an endodermal sinus tumor because it resembles a glomerulus. You can see that it, the different space in it, spaces in it looks like that of the glomerulus. So it does resemble a glomerulus. So this is an endodermal sinus or a yolk sac tumor. So the next slide, you can see there are two different types of cells in it. So we know that the tumor which produces two different types of cells are the choriocarcinoma. So there is one that is 
cytotrophoblast and there is syncytial trophoblast and syncytial trophoblast has multiple nuclei and it is larger because it has to secrete beta hcg whereas hc uh, whereas cytotrophoblast is a smaller one which is kind of a clear cytoplasm so hopefully it was very helpful for you because personally it was a very intimidating topic for me at first but then i figured out a way to learn this and this is why i broke down the ovarian tumors into three parts so you can really understand in depth all the details all the necessary and the high yield details because i always bear in mind that i have to get rid of the, all the extra information which is mentioned in the textbooks and it can get very long and boring so I try to introduce very uh, different way of learning so hopefully you like that please don't forget to like share or subscribe if you have any questions or queries please comment down below and I will get back to you uh, please wait for my next video stay tuned bye bye take care